Hey everybody, it's great to see you today. Today is July 26th, and this is Living Power, your online Bible study where we're walking through the Bible in a year. We are in the book of Isaiah, and I feel an immense privilege today. Of course, every day I do in bringing the message to you, but today it just feels just all that more special because today we're going to be talking about the heart of the gospel. And in these chapters, we can we can see the main message, the gist, the the main point of all that God is doing in his plan of redemption, and I can't wait to show you. Today we read a very well-known section of Isaiah. And it has to do with the suffering and the rejection of his servant, which is the Messiah to come, which we know is Jesus Christ. The main thing is that his suffering will lead to glory. And because of his actions, many people will be saved. Chapter 49 to 57 really describes the heart of the gospel. And today we're going to pick out some key verses that I know you will treasure and you will want to find and keep before you because surely Paul and other New Testament writers had this scripture and they would study from Isaiah and surely this is where they understood and were able to interpret and come up with the theology that they did that helped them to write the books of the New Testament. So I'm going to show you today where it all began. Isaiah 53 is quoted in the New Testament more than any other Old Testament chapter. And we are going to spend a lot of time in Isaiah 53 today. However, the reading starts in Isaiah 52 verse 13. And that's where I'd like to start today. My Bible entitles this section, The Lord's Suffering Servant. And this, of course, describes Jesus in his time here on earth and throughout his crucifixion where he took upon our sin and bore that sin for us on the cross so that we could have eternal life. This is depicting that, that situation. In verse 13, it says, see, my servant will prosper. He will be highly exalted. This is it. This is the gist right here that his suffering was necessary, was part of God's plan to bring glory so that he would be exalted. And truly Jesus is the exalted one for his name is above all names and he will ultimately judge all of the people for all things have been given to him into his power. In 53, chapter 53, verse 1, I'm going to break this down for you because this is, this is the heart of the gospel message that we need to understand. Verse 1 speaks about the mystery of the gospel. Paul talks about the mystery. How can it be this way? And this is the mystery of the gospel. Um, join me in verse 1. Who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? His powerful arm, meaning his mighty arm, the one he didn't use when he came and as and lived as a baby and allowed himself to be uh, seized, arrested, and crucified. Continuing in verse 2, My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. In Hebrew, this concept of a root in dry ground means it represents humiliation and weakness. This is the mystery of the gospel, that God would choose humiliation and weakness to bring salvation into the world. Jesus was born as a little baby. There isn't, you can't get much weaker than that. He did not use his power. He did not call on the angels to deliver him while he was here on earth. It, it goes on to say in verse 2, there was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance. He must have just looked like an ordinary Joe, just a regular normal old guy, nothing to attract us to him. He didn't come in royal robes. 
You know, he wore sandals and had dirty feet, just like the rest of the people. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with the greatest grief. This is the mystery of the gospel, that God could choose in weakness to bring such strength and such power. In verse 4, it was our weakness that he carried, his, our sickness that he carried. We were sick in sin. It was our sorrows or disease, in another translation, that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment from, for his own sin. Surely that's what many people thought when he was being crucified, that this man um, must you know, be scorned by God, must be rejected by God. Many people thought that. Crucifixion was a, um, and to die on a cross was, um, in, the, in the Jews' perspective, was a much um, despised, despised thing to have happened to you. However, these verses represent the heart of the gospel, and we continue in verse 5. This is it. You'll want to circle verse 5 and verse 6. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. It wasn't what it looked like. It, he wasn't being scored and rejected by God because of anything he had done, for he was taking on our sin, and he was doing this all for us. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. Here is the heart of the gospel. And it goes on, verse 7 to 11, to talk specifically about the life of, of Christ, the Messiah, he had done no wrong. He had never deceived anyone in verse 9, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. Joseph of Arimathea gave his, his, his grave site. He was a very rich man, and he gave, he was a, uh, a rabbi, probably one of the first believing rabbis, um, would be my guest, and he gave his, his tomb so that Jesus would be laid in that tomb. Verse 10, but it was the Lord's good plan to crush him. How can anything be good that turned out in death? That's the mystery of the gospel, and that's the mystery of our lives as well. So many things that appear bad in our life really could be just part of God's good plan for you. For here it is, Jesus living God's good plan out, and he was crushed, and it says it caused him much grief. Verse 10, yet when his life is made an offering for sin, here's the glory part. He will have many descendants, and he will enjoy a long life. This is the resurrection. And the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. Just like when we endure much suffering for the Lord's sake, he will turn it and make it into something good. And our life will prosper in the Lord's hands. When he sees that all is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. Jesus, it was his good pleasure, is what this is saying in verse 11, to go to the cross and to endure agony and to die for your sin. Isn't that amazing? And in continuing in verse 11, I have this part circled as well. And because of his experience, my righteous servant, Jesus the Messiah, will make it possible for many to be counted righteous for you and me. For he will bear all, not some, but all of their sins. And here is the heart of the gospel message in Isaiah 53. As you go through this Bible study with me, is the Old Testament coming alive to you? Are you falling in love? You loved the New Testament before we started, but many of you weren't sure about the Old. Are you beginning to fall madly in love with the original scriptures, the Old Testament? I know I am. In Isaiah 52, we read, Who can believe it that one man would save the world? It looked so bad. 
but it was God's plan. This is the mystery of the gospel that one man could save the entire world. And in Isaiah 53, we read about this mystery that God could have chosen to use his right arm, but he didn't. He chose to send his son into the world as a green, tender root that he would come in humiliation and weakness, and that through that action, his action as living as a suffering servant, he would invite all of us into eternal life with him. Jesus was not handsome, powerful, born in a big city, didn't come from a big, powerful family, for it was in his weakness that God made him strong. And here we see the heart of the gospel, that he carried our sins, bore our iniquities, took on our sickness, which was, of course, uh, sin, and it's, it's referred to as disease here. He, during his time on, on earth, acted so contrary to the power of God that was within his right to display he did not talk back. He did not raise his fist. He did not demand special treatment while he was on earth. And we learned through these scriptures that what looks bad, really bad, God can use for really good. It says here that Jesus will live a long life. He was resurrected. He lives today to intercede for us. That is his ministry at this present moment, to intercede for you and for me. He will be accepted, an acceptable offering for sin. He will prosper and he will save the people from their sins, both Israel and the Gentiles, to all who receive the invitation. And in verse 1 of Isaiah 55, we see a call to invitation. This is to the Gentiles. If you ever wanted to see a chapter that was written especially for you, a Gentile, this is it. We read a lot about Israel and the history of Israel and a lot of passages that speak directly to Israel. But here is one in Isaiah 55 that you can read specifically for you, a Gentile. Isaiah 55 starts with, Is anyone thirsty? This is to the Gentiles. Come and drink. This is your invitation. Even if you have no money, come take your choice of wine or milk. It's all free. Why spend your money on food that does not give you strength? Why pay for food that does you no good? It's a great question, isn't it? Listen to me and you will eat what is good. You will enjoy the finest foods. And here it continues in verse 3. The invitation, now is the call. Listen and you will find life. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. With you. I will give you all the unfailing love. All the unfailing love I promised to David. This to us the Gentiles, for God is going to make an everlasting covenant with us, just like he did with Abraham and Noah and David. Now he's going to make an everlasting covenant with us. And of course, this is the new covenant that we will read about in Jeremiah 33.3, where he promises to pour out his spirit, his Holy Spirit on us, and write the law, not on tablets of stone, but write the law on our hearts, that we would come to know him, believe in him, trust him, and that we would be able to serve and walk with him in a way that is holy and pleasing to the Lord. In verse 6, seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him now while he is near. This is the church age. We are living in this time. This invitation is open. It's open to anyone who would hear and heed the call. You can, at this very moment, accept Christ into your heart and receive this free gift of salvation, being reunited with the Lord for forever and enter into a life of peace and everlasting forgiveness and everlasting life after we die from this earth. It says all that needs to happen, number seven, let the wicked change their ways and banish the very thought of doing wrong. While it is a free gift, there is a price to pay. We have to leave the sin of our former life behind 
turn, repent, and now seek the Lord with our whole heart and seek to follow him and his ways. And it says, let them, in verse 7, let you turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on you. Yes, turn to God and he will forgive you generously. It doesn't matter what's in your past or what you've done or it just doesn't matter what's happened to you. The Lord will forgive all of those. And like he did for Jesus, he will take something that looks bad and he will turn it into something most wonderful because God is a God full of mercy who wants to invite you in to his family and call you a daughter or a son with full rights to the inheritance. He wants to bring you back into his family. You know, what does Christ's work on the cross mean? Well, to Israel, it means restoration. To the Gentiles, it means invitation. And to the unbelieving, those who refuse to believe, it means accusation. Isaiah 54 is about Israel. It's a picture of them getting back together after their separation. Isaiah 55 is about the Gentiles and his invitation to come in verse 1 to 5 to seek him in verse 6 to 13, and yet an invitation to worship in, verse 50, in chapter 56, verse 1 to 8. In Isaiah 56, we'll close here in verse 6, I will bless the foreigners, that's you and me, who commit themselves to the Lord, who serve him and love his name. Do you need to commit your life to the Lord today? Or perhaps do you need to recommit? After you read all of this wonderful work that the Lord has done, and you can see just His love dripping from these pages, His love for you is just overflowing, do you need to somehow commit or recommit your life? Do you love Him in purity with the fullness of your being? God deserves nothing less than our very best for he wants us to love him with our whole heart. Can you receive this invitation today and seek to love him more each and every day in purity and in truth with your whole absolute heart? Well, this is the message for today. I'm sorry, but it's time to quit. I knew you would enjoy re revisiting the message of the gospel and the, the purity and the mystery of it all. I hope this has been a blessing to you today. It has been my distinct honor and privilege to be the messenger to bring the word of God to you today. Blessings to you and your family. Until we meet again, shalom. Shalom.